we are live thank you good afternoon and welcome everyone to the virtual conference by entrepreneur india under our resilience series here we talk to business leaders who are striving to find out ways to fight the covid pandemic i am saurav kumar editor of special projects entrepreneur india your host and moderator for the session the covid 19 crisis has wrecked all economies across the globe the most advanced nations and businesses have been uh, not been spared well i'm sure that the world collectively will find a solution uh, sooner or later uh, to get back to normal uh, maybe uh, with the adjusted new normal nevertheless startups and businesses will need to use this period of dormancy to rethink and rebuild to come out stronger and be equipped to deal with future scenarios so in this series we talk about ways in which they can do it uh before we start first uh, let me just lay down the house rules for the day for our attendees uh the panel discussion will go on for 30 minutes uh this will be followed by a q and a session for the next 15 minutes if you have any questions during the course of the discussion you can post them through the q and a option our uh, facebook audience and other social uh, media audience can post their questions in the comment section we will take up those questions post the panel discussion we would also like to request our attendees to keep the questions within the scope of the discussion here let me now introduce and welcome our guests for the day dr gero decker co-founder and ceo of business transformation signapio welcome gero hey welcome great to be here thank you so just to introduce uh, signavio is a business transformation solutions provider that uh, enables companies to understand improve and ultimately transform their business processes based in berlin uh, signavio has operations in various parts of the world and counts the likes of dhl puma deloitte sap and many more as its uh, clients so uh, uh, you know to start with uh, for the benefit of our uh, audience if you can just briefly take us through what signavio does and then we will uh, continue our discussion yeah great yeah so so signavio we are a software provider we um built business process management software that is being used by mid-sized and large organizations um what the self, what the software um helps to do is understand how processes how business operations work today through methods like process mining and others um and it helps you shape basically the future of operations designing to be state of how you want to work tomorrow um you know change your customer journeys um and so on and so forth and and bring that to action um so you know it it serves the whole chain of understanding and proving and transforming business processes in mid-sized and large organizations okay all right so just to uh, first to start with uh, you know when this entire covid-19 uh, situation started uh, to you know uh, take shape across the world in various countries so i'm sure that uh, when it started there so you would have taken some basic steps or you know the first things that you would have done to tackle this problem and the opportunities that you saw that came out of this situation if you can share with us please. yeah sure it's 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 um great thanks for asking so this is actually our second crisis that we're going through so our company is is already in 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 the market for quite a number of years um we started in late 2008 early 2009 so when the start, the company was founded basically during the financial crisis and but at the time we didn't recognize the crisis as a crisis because our company was barely existing we didn't have a client base um but we were just surprised um or startled by the fact that there was a lot of interest in what we were doing but not many people buying right we thought this is just due to you know product maturity or not having the right marketing message out there but uh, in retrospect it was due to the crisis and nobody spending money so um so at the time we weren't really aware of the things that were happening and we could use the time really for for brand building getting a name out there um sharing our message getting people excited and interested so when things uh, started to pick back up in the second half of 2009 2010 uh, we were fully there also with 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 a good offering um that we were able to shape shape 
with the help of those people interested but not ready to buy it. Um, so now with COVID-19, the situation is vastly different. So we went into, you know, end of um, February, right? The world seemed in order. It was COVID-19 happening in China. We don't have a significant presence in China. We have a handful of customers um, over there. Um, and the rest of the world seemed unaffected, right? It seemed to be something contained and managed um, in, within China. And, uh, and only later, it, it appeared that it, you know, it surfaces on, on the global um, scheme. So we were in full expansion mode at the time. We had 150 open positions that we wanted to fill um, end of February. So we were in heavy recruiting mode. We were, you know, expanding on all fronts. And then suddenly COVID-19 arrives in all of the major markets that were super important for us. Um, first, Western Europe um, with Germany, um, France being hit pretty hard by COVID-19. UK um, followed soon after. And then with a little bit of a time lag of two to three weeks, the US followed suite and, and it really, you know, it was heavily impacted. New York, an epicenter of where many of our customers are, a lot of financial services companies and others based in New York, heavily hit by COVID-19. So, so suddenly you move from a heavy expansion mode to, um, to a crisis management mode, right? So, so the first steps that we did was, um, first, there's all of this uncertainty. How, how is the, the crisis going to impact you, right? We knew for sure that new business um, uh, sales um, would probably suffer big time from the crisis. People not spending now, but waiting until the worst is over or freezing budgets. Um, churn, you don't really, you can't really tell how many of your customers are going to go bankrupt or how many of them are going to slash their budgets and you're part of that, that savings um, initiative. So, so the first thing that we did was really m the most immediate cost containment measures that we could put in place. So the first thing that we did was a hiring freeze. Um, so, you know, not hiring anybody anymore um, for, you know, for a certain period of time. And then we really took the, t took the time, it took us two or three weeks to try to sift through the noise, read all of the signals, talk to a lot of customers to get an understanding of what's the scenario going to be, right? Who are the, the industry verticals hit the, the hardest? Um, who is still spending? Who is still bullish about the future? Who is in, in panic mode? Um, to have a rough understanding of, of where we could, you know, what it would mean for us from a revenue perspective. We completely revised our budget for the year, our, our business plan. Um, so from a very high growth mode, we would readjust and say, you know, what is a more realistic target um, for this year? Will we have less revenue at the end of the year, the same or, or grow? Um, and then based on that, um, you know, you look at your business and you really have to make a tough decision to say, what is really must have? What are the things that you, that you need? Um, and where are the things that you might have that are more nice to have, that you might have, um, you know, taken on board as a company, but that are really not, you know, essential. So, um, so we we managed through that, um, and um, yeah, and and basically from a from a business planning point of view, put the company on a new trajectory um, to get through 2020 and then also 2021. Mm -hmm. um, the, yeah, go ahead. <laughs> So, so I was just asking, so were there also hard decisions to be taken during this period? And if they were so, if you can just let us know that, what was the rationale for those decisions? I mean, the hardest, the toughest part always is, are two things. One is, for sure, every time it comes to people, right? So um, hiring people is very easy. Um, letting people go is very hard, right? So uh, people are there for a reason. So. So this is the step that you, that you want to avoid um, at all costs because it has taken you so much time to get good people on board. It has taken you so much time to onboard them. They are there for a reason. They're a part of the family. They're part of the company. So any step that you can avoid there, um, you know, is, is, um, is, 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 is important. So when it's about saving costs, it's, it, it must be first, you know, operational expenses um, the things where, where you cut first. Um, and also on the labor cost side, um, there are certain creative solutions that you can find. So for example, something that we did um, with our team that was um, accepted pretty well, actually, most people participated, 
um, was a salary to share shares conversion um, program. So we offered people at a very favorable price, a very favorable valuation to, to forego a part of their salary for the next 12 months um, and in return become a shareholder um, in the company. So, so this was one of the creative, the more creative solutions, I would say, um, to avoid um, having to having to cut deeply into um, in, into the employee base, but at the same time having certain um, you know cost um, savings effects um, that that help you navigate safely through the crisis, mm-hmm. right? And then the other tough decision is um, making choices between the here and now and building and investing for the future. Right. So in software, product development is a classic. Right. So the product development that you do doesn't help you this quarter or next quarter, most likely, but it helps you next year or the year after. Right. So whatever you do in product development is an investment into the future. Um, and uh, so juggling that between, you know, optimizing for, for short term outcomes, the things that help you navigate through the crisis. Um, um, you know, safely um, versus, um, you know, betting on a, on a good rebound in six months, nine months, 12 months from now, whenever it happens and be prepared um, for that, right? So this is the second big, big um, tough choice to make. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, uh, you know, uh, it is said that, you know, in a desperate of situations, people find opportunities and those who see those opportunities really try, uh, you know, going ahead. So, when this started, did you see some opportunities coming your way? Or did you think that, okay, fine, we are in this situation, but this is how I'm going to, you know, utilize the situation to be a better self tomorrow? Was there any instance that stuff? Yeah. Well, so, so one, how we work internally, obviously, is a big one. But then also the, the, the product and the value proposition to the market is the same. So how we work internally, um, so in traditionally, we always had a strong presence in Berlin as our headquarters. So more than two thirds of our employees have always been located in Berlin, Germany. So, um, and there was a strong um, tradition around being in the office to work, right? So it, only, only few people and only a certain limited amount of time, people would work from home uh, when being located in Berlin. This was already very different in our international location. So we are present in 15 countries um, so the employees in 15 different countries. Internationally, there were much smaller teams in the different countries. Um, they, they were part of a, of a global network, working remotely most of the time um, anyways. So um, in the past, we had all of these initiatives of exploring remote work and how should we best do it? And will productivity suffer or what are the implications, right? We, we did all of this thinking about it and suddenly you're forced to do it. Um, and you have to do it from one day to the other, right? And you, you can barely ship, you know, additional webcams or, you know, get additional equipment. <laughs> That's about the only thing that you can do. Or, or allow people to grab, a, you know, the, the chair I have here, I grabbed from the office and took it home with me on the, on the tube, right? So, uh, um, so, so this is, this is the, 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 you know, some small things that you can do. But, um, but suddenly you're forced to work from home um, from day one. So this was this happened pretty smoothly for us. And I must say it has a lot of advantages, especially working with the international teams. Now it doesn't matter anymore whether a colleague is down the street or whether a colleague is on a different continent, right? It always, it only takes sharing a zoom link to get together and, and work together, right? The stay, the time zones stay, that doesn't change through COVID-19, but, uh, but other than that location doesn't seem to matter these days anymore. So, so this is great. Um, and, and this is something that we will also keep going forward um, as a company. From a, from a product or value proposition point of view, um, you also try to imagine what is the new world going to look like, right? And for us, helping companies um, manage their, their processes and operations, there are many changes that, that companies go through these days and that help them prepare for the future. So one, is, one, one big theme out there is, is obviously the move to more digital. Um, and, and, you know, having to change your operations, your processes to be able to, to leverage technology more, right? But also the change in demands that your customers might have tomorrow and readjusting your customer experience to that. So 
whatever you can do, we, you know, this was one of the takeaways for us, the, whatever we can do to help, you know, make that transition to digital and this massive shift in, 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 in customer experiences and, and, and adjusting your, your company to that, whatever products we can, we can offer around these two themes um, helps us big time with the clients today already and going into the future. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Before uh, we go to the next question, I'll again request our attendees and uh, audience on our social media platforms to keep their questions coming. We'll take them uh, uh, post our discussion is over. So, Kiro, to uh, come back to you, uh, you know, business transformation, process management, these are things which, uh, which were, uh, which has suddenly become the need of the R and people now are starting to realize its value. So, you know, First, if you can make us understand that how does it really help uh, a, a business to tackle these kind of situations? And second, is it only for the large corporations who have, uh, you know, uh, large budgets and all who can do this, or smaller companies also who have tighter yeah. budgets who can can also can, can they also imbibe uh, these uh, 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 these uh, practices? So, so just taking a step back and, and how are companies reacting these days or um, you know, what are they going through? They typically go through four stages. Um, so stage number one, react in response to the immediate um, face of the crisis, right? Moving to home office, these types of things. Um, reconfiguring a supply chain that is completely broken. Right? So the second one that people have gone through or are still going through is saving cost. The third one is building operational resiliency and becoming more you know, becoming stronger from an operational perspective, also going into the future. And the fourth one is to renew and reinvent for the new normal, right? So, so drastically change the, the, the products, the offerings, the experience that you're offering to the market. Um, so if you go through all of these four, then process management and the products that we offer, um, you know, help in different shapes and forms in these different phases. The immediate reaction or response those companies who had already our software in place or who were already quite mature around process, for them it was quite easy to go through and say, this process is affected. These are the tasks that we need to change now. This is what's not working anymore. We need to work around for that and so on and so forth, right? So they could act very quickly. If you hadn't done that, it was just running around like a chicken without a head and trying to, you know, trying to make the best of the situation. Cost saving, how much can we help? Mm, a little bit. Um, because it's about making smart choices, right? What are the things that you want to keep? What are the things that you can really let go um, without having too much long-term harm for, for the company? Um, where process management and the stuff that we do and, and help support really helps is this phase three and phase four, um, operational resiliency. So in this crisis, many people realize that they have no clue how they operate, right? It was like, here's a goal, here's a set of smart people, let them run, right? And this might work in an environment that is very stable, where you can make certain assumptions about things, where you sit together in an office and can, can just you know, brain someone how to do it and you do it, right? So, so in this new world, you need, to have, you need to be a lot more smart about how you work, how you chop up the different responsibilities that you have to flesh out a lot more, what do we expect from each other? Where do we hand over stuff? Where are we really interacting? How do we make it work? Um, where are we using technology? Where don't we do it? Um, so, um, so this is where, you know, being, knowing how you operate and then making deliberate choices about what you need to change and what you need to keep or what do you want to build in also for future flexibility to be able to react to those types of things that happen now in the sense of business continuity and those types of questions. So this is where process management excels, right? And we see that um, we frequently check in with Gartner, for instance, and what companies are looking for. And operational excellence is, is one of the top research terms on Gartner. Um, because for the first time, people say, oh, wait a minute, we haven't understood our operations and they're completely broken now, right? And we need to fix it. Um, and the fourth piece, reinventing and renewing, is, a, is, is very much around centering around the customer and what they expect and what they expect now versus what they had expected in the past. And then building your operational model from that. Are these things only something for very large companies? Well, the larger you are, the higher the volumes you have, the more you can standardize as well, and, and the easier you can also leverage technology to, to automate 
a lot of the things that you're doing and, and, and thereby bringing efficiency and speed to, to things as well. But you have this inherent complexity that you need to manage through. For smaller businesses, well, the, the number one challenge is revisit your business model, right? What's the value proposition that you're bringing to market? What are the, what are the customer segments that you can still reach or that you will be able to reach? What are the fundamental shifts that you have in, in the future, right? So a lot of smaller companies are really questioning themselves in the model and the value proposition that they have today. And for, for obvious reasons and rightly so, right? Does process management help to, to, to go through? If you're a company with three or four or five employees, honestly, no, right? Because it, it, uh, that, that, that level of awareness, that level of structure actually doesn't help you when you're a company with five employees. If you're a company with 50 employees, of course it does, right? If you're 200 employees, for sure. Funny story, when um, one of our um, you know, early customers in the United States was a small company, they had 200 employees um, and were just going, you know, expanding heavily. So they, they needed to find a way how to bring that greatness that they had in themselves to the customer on a repeated basis. And that customer went by the name of Airbnb. Right, so one of the success stories in, in startup land now being hit very hard um, in COVID times, but, but for many years, the poster child of, of growth. So they started investing heavily in, in building that capability around process management when they were 200 people. And it served them super well to be able to grow to 500, a thousand, several thousand people because they could take the greatness that they had, delivering that great community experience to the customers but doing that at scale, doing that with you know, millions of bookings, right? Um, so um, for them, it came at the right time. And if they, if they had done it later, it would have been much more painful to, to, to navigate through the scale and the growth that they were going through. Okay. okay. So, uh, you know, as you say, and I, I, as I can understand, I believe uh, that, you know, uh, a lot of these smaller companies, as I was mentioning to you earlier also, in these kind of situations, if they have their processes in the correct, you know, their processes are correct and they, have, they are under some kind of automation or something. So it would be easier for them to keep their brand intact in these kind of situations. Would you believe that? Yes. Um, so, but it also depends on, on, on how big is your business already. So if you have an existing install base, an existing customer base, this is a great time to be as close to them as you've never been before, right? Um, and, you know, we see a lot of companies shifting from being, you know, 80% focused on new customers versus being focused 80% on their existing install base and existing user base and make them super happy and do the best they can for them. Because you build, in these times, you build loyalty and, and it's, it's so much easier to upsell and expand with existing customer base these days than it is to, to sign on new, right? So, so from that perspective, it, you know, having a customer base, having, having a user base is king these days. Um, getting heard out there, let's talk about marketing for, for a little bit, right? So, you know, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, marketing happened a lot offline, right? Um, you would go to events or, or other things, classic advertising that, that you, that you might do. Um, there was the big shift to digital already, but especially in B2B, it was always a mix, like a 50-50 mix or, or slightly different. Um, even, you know, in February, January this year, between, you know, physical or offline and, and digital. The offline channel is completely gone now, right? It doesn't happen anymore at the moment. So it's 100% it's digital. And um, smaller, nimble startups who are digital native might be tuned for that much better than the incumbents, right? The incumbents struggle much more, but um, everybody is going for digital these days, right? It has been super crowded um, to, to be heard. There's, there's so much noise. So what you see these days is that while you, you might have a lot more eyeballs on, on digital, the conversion rates might be not anywhere close to what you were used to from digital channels, right? Because there's just so much noise um, that you need to cut through. So, you know, not easy. Okay, okay. all right. So, uh, 
you know have you seen a spurt in adoption of your uh, products or your uh, offerings during this period of time where people have seen that these could be things that are required or uh, was it that the pace has been normal as usual they they used to so we've seen we've seen pretty much stable um stable usage of of our products but which means that those people who are still able to use it use it much more and then those people we we had a lot of industry verticals that were serving where people were simply sent to mandatory vacation right so if you take the automotive industry for instance you might have heard that many or most of the automotive um suppliers uh, or not, you know the automotive companies they actually stopped the assembly lines they stopped production for some time right so this has a this has a huge impact on the companies behind them where you send entire workforces tens of thousands hundreds of thousands of people home um not doing anything um for a month or even longer right so so in these types of and then all of the associated um areas with that these people obviously don't work um at that time right so this is where we've seen a decline for other people who were able to work they um they actually increase the usage why for the obvious reasons what i've said earlier continuity planning right scrambling understanding what they need to change what they need to do um or already start building for the future and thinking about you know what are the things that we always wanted to change and and you know we knew we had to change but we were just so busy doing other things and now finally we have you know the the, the platform is or the, or the reason is compelling enough to really do it now okay so uh, uh you know i have also seen that uh, your company works in terms of uh, customer experience so how does that really relate to operational excellence when it comes to it yeah yeah it's um if you if you look at, if you look a couple of years back where process management or operations management came from was mostly around um you know having stable operations saving cost standardizing meeting compliance um those types of things but there were a lot of companies um who were doing these regular um you know improvement cycles every year continuous improvement every year 5% better another 4% another 7% 7% better but then suddenly they wake up and their company and their offering has become irrelevant right because the customer just chose to go elsewhere right there was this great example by a customer of ours a telco company um in asia and um they were going through this continuous improvement mindset right and for example if you were a b2b customer and you ordered a dsl or broadband connectivity with them it would take them 28 days just to produce a quote to you right 28 days it's 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 a long, very long time so with their continuous improvement mindset they would bring it down from 28 days to 26 so they would bring it down from 26 to 25 and then to 23 but you know suddenly they woke up and they had become irrelevant in the market because there were these players out there who could give you that quote the same day right so not 5% 10% 15% better but you know 10 times or 50 times better than what you do today or doing something vastly different so this is what what a lot of people wake up to these days also with players like amazon and many others who just show you that you can do things vastly better um and vastly in a vastly more attractive way to the customer so um you know doesn't it might not even matter that you do things 5 or 10% better if you've missed the mark of what is really important to the customer so customer experience things like design thinking and so on they have been super, have become super important the last 5 years or so but for a long time it happened in complete isolation here you had your innovation teams they were building a cool app or they were having all of these creative ideas and then you had those people who were running the business right with a 20,000 employees and all the complexity behind the curtain and managing that but these two completely separate so what we've observed in the last 3 years is that bringing great customer experience to the customer means you have to really do it end to end in the sense of that it needs to translate into everything that you do as a company it needs to translate into the the processes it needs to translate into the mindset of the people to always know what is the experience that you're currently optimizing for what is the moment of truth that you're that you're paying in for um with your customers what is the sentiment with the customer that you're currently driving what is the behavior that you want to achieve with the customer to go forward and so on and so forth so um being a process management vendor traditionally 
um, we have we have seen that there's a convergence between customer experience and operational excellence, and it's, it has become the defining factor. Customer experience is the new north star. It is not cost. It is not um, standardization. It is you know delivering something great on a repeatable basis to the customer. So uh, you know, definitely with more competition coming in, you know, customer experience is something something gives you better I go there. But do you think in this in this in this process, uh, a lot of startups, you know, uh, give up on something called unit economics, you know, and then you know it becomes tougher for them going ahead. Do you think where where is that sweet spot? How do we, how does a company find that sweet spot of uh, you know between this uh, uh, investing in customer experience? and also taking care of their unit economics. We have seen across the world companies, you know, putting in a lot of money, but then you know, at the end they have to, you know, uh, pull down their rug. So what do we do? What, what, do, what does companies do? Yeah, I mean, unit economics, it's, it's, it's funny. Some people think this is, you know, God given, if you will, right? And, and no matter how much you scale, this will always be the same. This might be true for some areas where you have electricity costs or other things where you simply you know, can't negotiate around it and can't get around it. In other areas, unit economics are driven by many different influencing factors, right? It's how much of a premium can you command to, you know, justify certain things, for instance, right? Or how much of a, you know, repeat behavior do you have with a customer, um, which, you know, translates in, into a certain factor. So, so, so it's, People often come to me with a question and say, yeah, I could, I have the choice between great customer experience and cost. Okay. What should I go for? And the, the, um, the experience that we made with companies is that it's very surprising, but if you shoot for great customer experience, you oftentimes yield a cost optimization and, uh, and an efficiency optimization at the same time. It's very, very, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it seems, seems un illogical at, at first sight, but we've seen it working um, time and time again um, because, you know, discovering what the, what the customer needs oftentimes brings with it a higher degree of automation, for instance, because customers want faster service, for instance, right away. So the moment you're able to deliver that, guess what, you're, and you do that at scale, guess what, the, the cost has come down significantly. Right. So, so if you feel that you're in an either or choice, always go for customer experience because the customer experience is what drives, you know, your loyalty of customers and your uh, also organic, organic revenue growth. Right. And, and that will trump everything um, in the long run. Cost to serve. Yes, is important piece. So if you feel that you have opportunity to do something cheaper, faster, um, better without impacting the customer experience, right? Go for it. Slice out 50% of that cost, but always use the customer experience at your reference point to say these 50% costs or this 10% cost that we're saving here, how much does it really impact the customer or how much doesn't it? Without that reference point, everything becomes a cost optimization standpoint and you feel you can unit economics is everything. Guess what? Unit economics don't matter if you don't have any customers. So maybe if you improve your customer experience, they will be ready to pay you more in the future, maybe for your services. So maybe that could be one of the. So yeah. going, to, uh, going back to uh, our previous uh, previous question, and you know connecting it to so, in customer experience and uh, you know operational uh, 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 operational excellence, where does uh, the entire piece of data and artificial intelligence come in? You know how how. How does that play a role and how do you, how do you put that to factor? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so the great thing, well, let's start with, with, with customer experience. What is different now than, than previously is that you're able through all of these digital touch points that you have um, and additional data sources that you might be able to tap into, you know so much more about your customer, their preferences, their behavior, um, that you can be much closer. It can feel very, very intimate. You can do something really, really close to your customers now without having to physically be in contact with your customer, right? So, um, so, so this is one where, where the use of data gives you a lot more insights about what your customers want. If you don't have enough data points in there, make it measurable somehow, right? There are the good old surveys that you can inject um, 
put in gamification or whatever have you just to get additional sentiment um, from, from your customers. Use natural language processing to sift through all of the touch points that you have with customers through phone or email or so on, right? And make the unstructured data st structured um, in a way or analyzable um, so that you can, you can understand these things at scale. Because if you look at individual um, interactions, they might not tell, give you the full picture. If you see the whole volume and you're able to analyze, that gives you a ton of information. And the same thing goes for operational excellence. In the past, people would go about you know, doing workshops, asking a lot of people for their input and their ideas how to improve things. This is still very, very important. And this is honestly still the most efficient way to do it for, for many scenarios. But if you have the data available in every system um, holds tons of that data, um, the moment you have it available in, in enough quantities, you can, you can leverage that to find things that you might not have been looking for um, initially, right? So um, for instance, we had a container ship um, you know, operator and they were complaining about you know, super inefficient um, supply management um, processes. By, by asking people, they wouldn't find why that is the case, why they spend so much money, so many people doing this, so many escalations they had to work with. In the end, they looked at the data they analyzed and they found that people were doing a workaround all the time because the data in a certain you know, inventory catalog um, was so bad that people stopped trusting it and used all kinds of manual workarounds around it to do it, right? So this was something that, that was only being uncovered through you know, a data-driven analytic exercise, um, which would have gone un you know, undiscovered before. They were able to speed up the thing by factor five. They were able to reduce costs by, you know, factor two to three um, by doing these steps, right? So that's why if you look at operational excellence, um, we call it, there's a combination of data, data driven. So leveraging all of the data that you have to uncover those, those things, but also human centered because all of the creativity, the future, future state design won't be done by machines, but it's always a human with that creativity to come up with great solutions of how to do things better. And also to mobilize people to, um, to, to implement that change and, and, and change their behavior. Mm -hmm. okay. So before I go ahead with my uh, other questions, uh, I'll see some of the ones that have come to us. So, you know, there's uh, this question we have got, uh, it says that, are you planning to introduce new low cost products or more changes to existing products so, so as to make them more affordable right now for smaller businesses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, this is the beauty of the cloud anyways, right? So we have, when we started 11 years ago with a company, we built for the cloud. We built multi-tenant so that you can start using the software at the click of a button. The deployment takes 10 seconds um, and you have a new workspace for a new customer, right? So these are the underpinning, talking about unit economics um, and cost of serve. Um, you know, with scalable infrastructure, not having to give every customer, a, a, you know, a virtual machine, but rather, you know, a fresh of a virtual machine, um, that, that all helps, right, to do that. Um, having said that, also, you know, as an advice to startups out there, the, often a cost driver is not so much um, how much, you know, is not the cost to operate in the end. But the question is what kind of go to market model and sales model can you efficiently run to make that happen, right? Just because you introduce a, a cheaper option on the website that you can you know, use with your credit card doesn't mean that people come in, you know, in the thousands um, to use it, right? So, um, so you really need to have a fine balance between the go to market model, the, the marketing and sales machine that you have and being able to cater for that and not cannibalize what you're doing. So back to your question, um, right now we have a focus on midsize and large corporations, right? And there is a certain spend band, a band um, that they operate in. And this is what we optimize for as a company um, from a from go to market model. Um, for smaller organizations, we have certain, for educational use, our software is for free. Um, but also for um, you know, NGOs, for instance, or in COVID times for everybody who's fighting the pandemic actively, like in terms of you know, health um, institutions um, and so on and so forth. 
um, we have given away our software completely for free, right? Because it's a group of people that we normally wouldn't target with our, with our go-to-market channel. But, you know, serving a complete band from a one-man um, uh, shop all the way to a one million employee shop, you know, there are very few companies in the world who make it work from a go-to-market model to serve all of them. So it's, it's typically a choice, whether you're more small business um, software with low, you know, with no touch, all automated, everything's community driven, um, or you have more of a, you know, mid-market and, and, and um, large cap strategy where it's a lot more about um, catering for the individual needs of the customer, um, doing, you know, personalized proof of value, proof of concept type initiatives and so on, right? Something that you can't do if you give away your software for, let's say, $1,000 per, per year. So, uh, but still, I would believe that, you know, even if the number of employees is uh, lesser, but the nature of business includes a lot of data or maybe a lot of, uh, you know, customer base, I think for them, there could be solutions that could come out and would fit in with the... Sure. Yeah. If the need is high enough, our smallest customer has 20, 23 employees. Um, they're so heavily regulated um, yeah. that they need to do something, uh, that, that they need to prove. They need to do stuff that normally only much larger companies would do, right? So it's part of, of their license to operate, if you will, um, mm -hmm. their ticket to play, um, to use software that otherwise only larger organizations use. But honestly, when we build our, our products, we typically say it's designed for organizations with at least 500 employees. Um, this is where, where you have the definite complexity, the definite need, and, and kind of the guaranteed ROI um, to, to justify not only spend for software, but also the time that you invest doing it um, and, and making it useful for you. Uh, we have a question from uh, uh, Pawan Kalyan. He says, uh, can we have his uh, audio, please? Let's see if he has a question. Pawan? Uh, I don't think uh, we can uh, be able to speak. Anyway, so uh, we'll just move on to our uh, next question that we have uh, uh, that we have got. So uh, you know, it's for you. Uh, uh, so considering a large part of your workforce works on product development, could it potentially mean that Signavio uh, pushing ahead, uh, pushing hard on remote working even after things better? Yes, that's something because we've seen. A lot of companies in India also, a lot of behemoth companies, blue chip companies, have said permanently two third of their employees will now work from home, no matter what. Yeah. And, and you hear announcements from all kinds of companies, uh, Facebook, Google, others who, um, um, who uh, you know, go for much more remote work um, going forward. I think it's just, it's not a particularity about us as a company. I think that's the new, the new normal for, um, for software, software companies like ours. It's very interesting. If you look into our um, company and organization, everybody in, in or people in product development, they really appreciate the, the, the flexibility and the ability to work from home now um, versus in, in, in many of the go to market teams, people say, oh, I can't wait to, to get back to, to meeting the, you know, the colleagues in the office, having a beer together. You know, it's, it's all about, you know, I love this because it's, it, because of the social environment, right? So, um, you know, you have, you have different flavors. So what might happen in the future is that you have, that you work more from home, but that you have, you know, specific socialization forms, right? Um, outside of, of getting the job done, uh, where you still need people physically on a, I don't know, once a week basis or, or whatever have you, just to have that spirit Mm -hmm. um, that, that, you know, that feel that social cohesion as well as a team. Um, I think that's still, I think that's still important. Um, and going a hundred percent remote, not seeing each other for six months. For me, it's still hard to imagine how that would work for, for the vast majority of, of software companies. Very few in the past have done it. And, uh, so I think it's going to be a mix, but we will see a lot more remote work going forward for sure. Okay. 
Okay, I'm I'm sure that you know we all would miss uh, you know those water cooler moments and uh, you know the small breaks or catch up on lunch you know just uh, during the office because that's kind of place where you uh, you know the team building that happens. Uh, so uh, I see that uh, Pawan has posted his question, so I'll just read it out to you. Uh, how does a small uh, company manage its economic decline uh, after the crisis the crisis ends? I mean. Uh, I think more, more what he wants to know is that, uh, of course, that, you know, right now, uh, revenues are zero for a lot of companies, possibly these companies also seen a very bad decline. I mean, how do they uh, quickly get back on track or maybe quickly get back to their feet uh, is what the question is, if you want to answer that. Now, specifically in, in COVID times, I mean, right? Yeah. I mean, it's, it, it, the, 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 the short answer is really it depends, right? It depends on, on what you do. So I think as, as, B2B, um, as B2B providers, it's, it's, it's much easier because companies need continuity, right? Everybody knows that the crisis is over at some point and you need to prepare for that, right? It's not the end of the world. People know that. With B2C is much harder because it, your behavior might be changed completely, right? If you're not going out anymore, if you're not leaving your house, well, you simply don't do many of the things that you used to do, right? So how do you get that back up? Well, you can't force people to, to you know, change their behavior to how they did it before, right? So, so that's, that's really a tough call and it might, you know, sometimes it might be waiting for things to normalize again. Sometimes it might be, you know, reinventing how you deliver the service. So, for example, there was one beta C company here in Berlin that changed their business model or their delivery model um, within a matter of a week or two. Uh, it's a company called Art Night. Um, what they do is you sign up and you basically meet in the evening to paint pictures together. Um, it's like a social thing and um, it, it, it's a little bit like paint by the numbers, but in groups of 20, 30 people, right? It, it's, it's good fun. Um, so they were, they were doing well, but suddenly people were not allowed to do that anymore, right? Because of the lockdown. So, um, and they moved it within a, a matter of one or two weeks to virtual sessions like that. So they would send the kit, the, the, the kits, um, you know, including the colors and the palette and everything to people's home. They would, you know, they would set up Zoom and, you know, try out different things. Um, they would even, you know, send you a sample of, of a drink or whatever right, to, to go with it. So, so make it completely, you know, replicated in, in your home. And then you would have, you know, 20 people dialing in um, and, and meeting through software like, like this and others um, to, to still have kind of the experience. So did the revenue drop? Yes, for sure, right? But did it go to zero? No, it didn't. They could recover quite a bit of it um, through this new um, offering because people, you know, you know, other than doing this, they might have to watch Netflix the whole day, right? And uh, and, and people long for doing other things, right? So um, so this is just a small example of, of a company having shifted their, their B2C model pretty, pretty swiftly and quite successfully. So I believe, uh, you know, adapting to the new normal and adapting to the new situations is the key here, how quickly you respond and adapt your offerings to the new, uh, you know, whatever scenario, the lockdown or whatever you're doing. So, uh, Giroj, before I let you go, uh, you know, a parting thought and a question for you is that you have seen, you said that you know, your company was born during a crisis and now you're again seeing one. And I'm sure that this has given you enough, enough experience to, uh, you know, to, to give, uh, to tell our uh, viewers and our audience that, you know, uh, it's, 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 it's never, a, it's, 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 it's not going to die. It's going to be there. You just need to hang on maybe. So what would be your parting advice to them? Well, the, so the, the one guiding thought is really, there's, there's always light at the end of a tunnel, right? These prices, they, they might seem super hard when they occur. And it seems like the world is falling on top of you. Um, and it's very tough to make those decisions and, and set yourself up for success again. And it might seem impossible, incredibly hard to do that. But the good news is things, things rebound. Um, and uh, the world might look slightly different, but, but the world rebounds. So, you know, never, never lose your optimism, right? Never stop believing. 
uh, that, that the things are, are, are going to change to the better. Surviving, yes, for sure, is, is, is um, you know, priority number one. But then also, you know, every piece of energy that you have left, prepare for, for the rebound that is about to come. Thank you so much, Juro. It was wonderful uh, to have you here uh, with us. And I'm sure that, uh, you know, the audience would uh, realize and understand that, you know, sticking around and just staying above the water right now and adapting to changes quickly and, uh, you know, be prepared for such situations in the future with having your processes correct, with your, uh, you know, uh, strategies correct would be something that would be required. So thank you again so much. And thank you for, uh, thank you to our audience also. We wish to see you again on our, uh, on this series, uh, Resilience, uh, once again more. Thank you. Great. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.